the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? For those of you who are visiting here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating, celebrating life, celebrating art, celebrating whatever it is that we can find to celebrate in this great world that we're living in that's a little wonky right now. Um, a few things that I'd like to celebrate. Um, I want to celebrate our writers in Hollywood. I stand in solidarity with all of our writers and all of the actors that are on strike. They are striking for all the right reasons, so support them. If you can join them in the picket line, do that as well. I also want to celebrate my dear friend Danielle, uh, who most of you know, she's been on the show a few times. A few weeks ago, Danielle uh, sent me to Susan Silver's Instagram page. And she said, Richard, have you had her on your show? If not, you have to have her. And I think the universe is conspiring to make this happen because Susan mentioned today, before we even started, one of her best friends and publicist and my best friend, uh, that's Judy Chorsky. That Judy had suggested Susan, come on the show. So, Judy, I didn't go over your head. It was suggested to me by Danielle. I am so thrilled that you're here, Susan. Uh, your book is so much fun. Um, you said to me uh, something which uh, we'll share a little later, uh, things that I will learn about you. Uh -oh. uh, I want to ask you, and I've learned a lot, uh, who or what are you celebrating today? Ah, what a good question. Um, I think I'm I'm celebrating being alive and well in a time when things in the world are awful. Sadly, I lost three wonderful people last month, which really was a wake up call. And and interesting that you say, because I went on Facebook, I said, please tell the people you love that you love them and stay in contact because we don't know what's going to happen. So, um, and oh, and yesterday I went to see a fun play. So for the first time I've been out of the house in like years and I laughed and that's important to laugh is big. So what did you see? I saw something by um, a wonderful comic named Alex Edelman called Just For Us. And it's about, he's a, a brilliant comic from London and New York and Jewish and very involved with his Judaism, as am I. And he went to a white supremacist meeting surrounded by quasi-Nazis. And it's fun, believe it or not. It was, it was an amazing evening. You know, Frank Delala, who I love on, uh, on stage, was talking about this show last week. And he said, keep your eyes out because he's going to be up there with Billy Crystal and Jerry Seinfeld and all the greats. Uh, so congratulations to him. I'm so thrilled for him. Yeah, it was quite an evening and it made you think. And it was interesting because I looked around the audience. There were quite a few Jewish people. How do I know? You just do. And uh, then there were some Asian people. I talked to an Indian woman and she said, you know, all of us who feel different or as minorities could relate to what he was saying. And with the terrible rise of anti-Semitism now over the last couple of years, it's very important. But it was so good to laugh. Oh, my God, Richard, it's so important to laugh. Well, it, it's very important. You know, I have a dear friend. Uh, she was a dear friend, and I still feel that she's here. I'll share her picture. I drop her name a lot, and that was my dear friend, Carol Channing. Oh, my gosh. Now, Carol Channing, I mentioned her because she, too, was an only child. And there are things that you shared about being an only child in your book that she used to share with myself and other people as well. But one of the things that she said, uh, in order for a show to succeed, and this is whether you're writing for television or writing for the theater, in order for a show to succeed, you need people from all walks of life. You need every minority. You need uh, every. You need doctors and lawyers and Indians uh, and everything you can get in that group because together we all share in the collective experience of music and laughter. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And I kind of, afterward, he asked people to wait for him outside and he would talk. So I waited and I talked to some people to find out what brought them there and what they felt about it. And it was wonderful. And to think and laugh both, very important. And I've been 
as I had told you, kind of isolated during the pandemic. As an only child and a writer, I thought, oh, and I'll be a great old lady. I wasn't. It was <laughs> terrible. The only good thing was that I let my hair go silver and it's changed my life. People have stopped me on the street to say, is that your real color? I say yes. And it saves me $4,000 a year. So there. Well, Susan, you know, it's very interesting. I, I talk about the circumstances that shape who we are and you shape these circumstances as well. One you just mentioned, we both mentioned, uh, you being an only child. Uh, that's circumstances that are out of your control. Um, you know, interestingly enough, yesterday I had Julian Schlossberg on the show. He too is an only child. I knew him a hundred years ago. Yes, it's just incredible. And, you know, and Carol used to say to me that she created her imaginary friends with her dolls and yes. she, would, she would have tea parties. Yes. Uh, with dolls and, and she never uh, regretted, as some people will ask, do you regret being an only child? She had a very full life and you did as well. You know, it's interesting because when I was a little kid, I played with my dolls, which I still have in my bedroom. And my daddy built me a doll's house and everything. And I, I never really felt lonely because I had my imagination. I think it helped me become a writer. Now I wish I had family. I adopt family. I have three Israeli soldiers that I've kind of adopted and sent to college who are now grown and they're my family and they have children. I'm a baby whisperer. I look for cute babies and Fortunately, a baby moved next door to me. They're renting. So now I have 10 minutes of baby every day, which I crave. That's and the most important thing in the world. I just, most I, important. I always think as I see these children, may they have a wonderful life because I know what my childhood was like at five years of age. And we're going to get to you as well. But one of the things that I want to start off with, and I hope you will not hate me for what I'm about to do, uh, but in your, I always begin my show with a mystery question. Okay. And in your book, you talk about the lady and the tiger. So I've got two cards. I've got the lady and the tiger. And I'm going to let you pull either the lady or the tiger. And we're going to see where that takes us. Well, do people know about that story? Should we fill in a little? You want to tell them or should I tell them? You tell them. Well, there's a story about either there's a, a beautiful lady or there is a tiger on the Behind other the door. door. And opening that door is going to really propel your future, I believe. So am I getting that right or? Yes, and I, I said that I don't tolerate ambiguity well. I always needed to know the answer. And when I read a mystery now, I sometimes I look at the back to find out who did it first because I can't stand not knowing. <clears throat> so in this case, the lady and the tiger always was kind of a scary thing to me. And The Secret Garden was my special story when I was little, that and Nancy Drew, but I'm gonna pick the lady. So the lady, this is the lady question. Share something vulnerable uh, with someone that you care about to deepen your connection. What is, uh, you've, there's so many things that you share in your book. I was gonna say, read the book. I share them too much, probably. So I wanna ask you, I mean, your book is, you know, Hot Pants in Hollywood, Sex, Secrets, and Sitcoms. Are there any secrets that did not make it to the book? Yes, um, I don't name names. Um, when I was looking for a publisher, they said, well, we wanna know who these famous people were that you had encounters with. I said, no, this is not, my book is not and then I slept with, it's not. Um, and so I, I protect the innocent and the guilty and myself a little, but I did have to wait until my parents had passed because I didn't want them to know everything either. But I think I reveal, I do reveal a lot in my book. And the funny thing, Richard, is when you're writing, you're doing it in a room by yourself and you don't think that someday people are gonna read this and know everything about you, but um, they do and they will. <laughs> I love in your book that you mentioned that when you were writing a particular episode of Maud, uh, which you were a female writer in the room, everyone, uh, when you were writing for Maud and there was this, a moment where, where she was going to the th a therapist, and your mom asked you about that particular episode. The daughter um, was going to a therapist and I, I only wrote for my own life because I didn't know you were allowed to make things up back in the day when I started out. There were very few women writers. There were one or two. And when I started, I really had no mentors other than my, Gary Marshall, the great writer director was my manager and he kind of helped me. And so when I pitched my story at Maud, I pitched the story of how when I went to therapy, my mother said, are you gonna blame it all on the mother? I said, yeah, of course. 
And so the mod was, Carol blamed it all on her mother, of course. <laughs> well, let's go back. You were uh, born uh, just outside of Milwaukee. Am I right? Or were you born? I was born in Milwaukee, actually, on the west side. Then we moved to a suburb, Whitefish Bay, when I was 10 years old. I skipped fourth grade which was an interesting experience because I was younger and afraid and new. And I was uh, being an only child. And I said in the book, I was, I wasn't allowed to do anything like cross the main street till I was 12 years old. And somehow my life has been always conquering my fears. I still don't know how to swim though. So there you go. Well, well I, I mentioned to you before we went live, there are a lot of similarities <laughs> and that's one of them. I can't swim. Can't swim either. And I grew up in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. When I was a small child, I almost drowned. And that fear has oh taken me my whole life. See, I, I took lessons and I was afraid and I can't, you know, I can't breathe underwater. And it's just terrible because you can't enjoy going on a boat or anything, you know, and it's not good. <laughs> Babies now are learning to swim and they're like one and two years old. And, and some are, you know, uh, come into the world underwater. Uh, it, it, there's a birthing process that a lot Well, I was a cesarean baby, so I said I never swam in the first place. So there you go. <laughs> so you um, also give us a glimpse. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. I'm just going to give teasers as we do the interview today because we want everyone to get the book. And the book, thank God for you, um, it's, you know, this is a difficult book to find. I went through Amazon and I went through Barnes and Noble, and uh, I don't it's like just, hearing that. It should be Amazon. You, I have three versions that Amazon. I have the audio, which I did, which was tremendously fun. Great paperback great. and the Kindle. And I, after you told me you had a problem, I I went on to Amazon and they said, no, no, no. If somebody orders it, they said we'll get it to you in two days, and then they go to Book Baby and they get it. So they they should be getting it. Well, I jumped through hoops and I got my own copy and thank God I did. That was such a great read. Um, let's go with your parents. Uh, you really give us a glimpse into both your mom and your dad uh, and how their lives shaped you early, early on. Let's start with your description of them and the earliest influences on your life. Um, you know, uh, aside from the sex secrets and sitcom, um, my book is really about baby boomers and our lives. I've gone through everything that most of us have, um, marriage, divorce, illness, losing your parents. Um, I almost died a couple times. Mm -hmm. And the themes are uh, reinvention, which I think you have to do every 20 years as we live longer, resilience, which I didn't know I had until I wrote the book, and relationships, as we've talked about. Um, my parents were older than most parents. My daddy and I were inordinately close. Um, I dream about him at night. I'm still trying to save him and I can't. My mother and I were at odds until I was 35 and I had a lump on my breast and she came out to California and was with me during the operation, which turned out to be okay. And we both cried and, and she said to me, you know, I have a life too. And I never realized that because she was always my mother and I was an only child and my father loved me. And, you know, there was always that dynamic. But, um, I miss my parents every day now, more and more, which is kind of strange. <laughs> it's interesting, the dynamics between us and our parents. You know, I read somewhere recently where it said that our lives are like the uh, director's cut. In other words, how we present ourselves to the world. And as I'm reading your book, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of my own relationship with my mom, who, thank God, is still with us. Oh, but I lost my father years ago. And uh, the relationship that I had with my father was a very volatile relationship, ah. uh, for better or for worse. I still love him. Uh, but the way that we perceive our parents and the way that they perceive us is not necessarily how the rest of the world sees our parents. And you describe your mother, uh, and it's almost on some levels, like you know, all the neighborhood kids loved her, yeah, we come over. My mother was very social, very fun. They're all the my boyfriends liked her more than me and everything. You know, we were always competing. My father was this brilliant out of an Arthur Miller play to me because he was this brilliant. He taught himself how to play the piano. He was a lawyer. He drew. He he was all these things. But because of family circumstances, uh, he wound up uh, in the furniture business with my grandfather. It was kind of an unrequited 
career life and he wrote a novel at the age of 80 and my father and I were, as I said, inordinately close. And I was very lucky. Most of my friends didn't have the kind of relationship with their father that I did. And um, yeah, it, it, as an only child now, I realized I was part of a triangle, which as you'll know in the book, followed me in my life and relationships. But it, it obviously was pivotal. But until I wrote my book, I didn't really realize a lot of things. You know, you realize it uh, from a distance. And I, as I say, I'm missing my parents more and more now. And I wish I believed in an afterlife or was religious because I don't. And it makes me sad because I'd sure love to see them again. Well, you know, I, I, be, I always believe that, our, uh, that those have passed on. It's as if they're in the next room. Uh, so that's the way that I like to imagine them. So think of your parents as being in the next room. Uh, it's like they're a phone call away or something, but- I do dream. I dream about my daddy all the time and I have pictures of my parents everywhere. And um, and every once in a while you say, oops, I've become my mother. Yes. <laughs> well, just, I asked for a photograph of you at five years of age. <laughs> I sent you kind of scary one. Uh, you know, I love this photograph. There's a lot of symbolism. I don't know what the heck I was doing with that. But before I bring the picture on, the reason that I choose a five-year-old self is because to me, it's the purest self. It's before life begins to tell you who you should be, who you are, peer pressure. And in today's world, as we all know, we're not going to get political, but kids are not being allowed to be themselves. And whatever they are, whoever they are. The internet and all these terrible stories of kids being bullied and, and, and their lives being ruined. It's, it's horrible. It's so sad. So here is the photo. And I love this photo. What can you Susie you with a saw. Why, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what can you tell us about this picture? I have no idea. I have a a big frame of all my baby pictures and different things. And that one just always was so hysterical to me. I don't know what the heck I was doing with it. Well, I love it. I love, first of all, that it's like, I look at it and the symbolism that I see having read your book is you're going to saw your way right through Hollywood and everything <laughs> else. And here you are in this beautiful little outfit, uh, but ready to go to work. Oh my God, I don't know what it was, but my mother dressed me beautifully. I will say my mother was a personal shopper and I did inherit, if I may say, taste from her. And I still have some of her coats that I wear. And when I walk out on the street, people compliment me. I say, these are my mother's coats. I still, but that picture kills me. I don't know what the heck I was doing with that saw because I'm very unhandy. So in the fourth grade, you skip the grade. Um, what did that do for you psychologically at that point in your life? I mean, your kids that you were going to school with are not advancing with you. Well, I moved. Uh, we moved from uh, inner city Milwaukee to the suburb of, you know, upscale kind of thing. And I all of a sudden I was, a, you know, a year ahead. And I, I think it was kind of traumatic, to tell you the truth. But they and I was very sensitive. They told my mother she's sensitive. She's smart, but she's sensitive. But I um, I always need friends and I had wonderful and I still have wonderful friends, some of them still from grade school, believe it or not. And I, I got into a crowd and, and it was nice. And the boy across the street with whom I had like on and off romance for as a 10 year old or whatever. And um, it, it was difficult moving into a new school, but somehow uh, it worked out. But I yeah, I skipped fourth grade. I don't know why, but I did. Another similarity you and I have, uh, we, you didn't go to your prom. No, I didn't go to my junior prom. I was dating college boys, which seemed fun. But then when it came time for the prom, no one asked me. Wow, wow. Uh, <laughs> growing up and looking back on that period of your life, because we're going to move ahead, but did you have any glimmer of where you wanted to see yourself in the world? I did. Um, my uncle, my mother's brother, was a very well-known Hollywood writer and producer. Uh, his name was Cy Howard. He was married to the movie star Gloria Graham. Graham. Yes. And he, um, he did some radio and then TV shows and everything. But my parents were terribly against my being in show business. 
So I kind of, I always knew I was funny because I was funny to entertain myself. Mm -hmm. And the first time I really knew that it worked was when I was at Northwestern. I was only allowed to go 90 miles to Northwestern. I wasn't allowed to go to California. Um, I, there was a show called Wom U, which was the college uh, humor show, very famous show that and Margaret and a lot of famous people were in, Paul Apprentice, Dick Benjamin. And I wrote, I was in it as a showgirl, but I also wrote a sketch. And when I was standing in the back and I heard people laugh at the sketch, I said, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to write funny. And I knew somehow I was going to go to California. I didn't know how I was going to get there because my parents didn't want me to. But in my junior year, my uncle said I could live with him. And they said, okay, they allowed me to go and, and live with him for a semester. And then I went to UCLA and there I was. Well, while you're out in Hollywood, you start getting uh, bit parts, background work in, uh, uh, in TV shows and movies. I didn't want to go home for the summer. Who would want to go home to Milwaukee when you're in LA? So I became an extra in the movies. And, and my uncle was very upset about it because he knew my mother would blame him and she did. But it was lots of fun. I, I got to meet as you'll see in the book, a lot of people like Steve McQueen. David Jansen. And David Jansen, Jimmy Garner, a lot of good people. Elvis. I was in Viva Las Vegas. If There's a picture in the book, and if you look fast, in Viva Las Vegas, I'm a showgirl walking behind Elvis. And there's a little story there about Elvis and me, which we That's the book, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there is a story there. Um, but then eventually, um, you had a phenomenal mentor. And that was Gary Marshall. Gary Marshall. I was working, doing casting and advertising. And then there was a show called Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. I did the casting for that. And my boss died. I had nothing to do with it, I swear. And I became the casting director. And I wanted to write. And they wouldn't let me write. I've said this before. And it, in New York Times, there's an article. It says, mm -hmm. they, I couldn't write because I was a girl. Now, what does that mean? My boss said to me, you can't write because you're a girl. I said, why? And he said, because they're in an apartment wearing their underwear and they're all guys and they want to fart. And I and said, you got the word in the New York Times. I, got the word. I thought when I said, it, I thought they'd say, make you say pass gas, but they did say fart in the New York Times, which is a great accomplishment. Well, <laughs> anyway. when you're a writer. Was there any uh, pushback uh, with you even being able to say the word fart in the New York Times? No. They accepted it. I thought I said you you can say pass gas. They said no, we'll say fart. So that was times <laughs> and change. You could say fart, but I I met a girl named Iris Rainer Dart who went on to write Beaches, and um, she was managed by Gary Marshall. He had started a management company for his father, and you know his sister was Penny Marshall, and he was doing The Odd Couple, and he was managing young writers. And Iris and I wrote a Love American style, and back in the day I had never even seen a real script because. Film school was not the same as it is now. Everybody is very sophisticated now. Then we weren't. And then Iris took a break to have a baby and the Mary Tyler Moore show came on. And I said, Gary, I can do this show. I'm from Milwaukee. She's from Minneapolis. Everybody thinks it's the same place. I worked in a local TV station in LA. She worked. So he said, well, I'll get you an appointment there. And because he recommended me, they saw me. And I went in with five stories of my own life because I didn't know you were allowed to make it up. And they said, if we get picked up for the real season, you'll be the first person we hire. So I said it was starting on top and downhill for the next 20 years, Richard. No, but, you know, I want to go back a moment. When you were staying with your uncle and you started doing uh, background work in film, uh, that was a means to an end so that you didn't have to go home. But you never really liked being in front of the camera. Mm -mm. I didn't want to be an actress and I didn't like it. And I, when you're an extra, you're sitting around for all day waiting and, you know, whenever it never appealed to me. And I, I didn't want to be a character. I wanted to be myself. And I never really ever wanted to be an actress. I knew I wanted to be a writer and you just had to find a way to get in there. Well, I want to talk about the title of your book. And I know how you came up with the title. And I actually pulled something up here I want to share with everybody. And this is the, oh. uh, here you are uh, in TV Guide Magazine. Uh, before we talk about your title. <laughs> what am I wearing? No, that's not what I was gonna ask you. Your mom's response when you told her that you were in TV Guide. Yeah. Because it's it's, 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 
this always wins the my mother drove me crazy title. I said, mother, guess what? I'm in TV Guide. And she said, that's nice. Are you on the cover? You could always get an A, but you could, I mean, an A minus, but you could never get an A. <laughs> you know, that usually wins in the contest story. I don't know about your mother, but. Uh, you know. No, I'm about to say you, and uh, that's one thing that your mom and I share. <laughs> and it, you know, it's funny how they can just find the right words to, uh, you know. and it They humbles. know, they had to give you the little dig. But it humbles you. Um, and that, you know, particular article, um, tell us how the article came about. Well, feminists, I, I'm so sorry to say this, but back in the day, that was the outfit. And I actually wore it to meetings. And somebody was at the Mary Tyler Moore taping. And my first show, they introduced me and they said, you know, she's a really good writer, but you don't. They said something about I had good legs. You had great legs. Yeah. So TV guy got a hold of that story and they asked me if I would wear the hot pants and I did. And it got me tons of publicity. And nowadays we would think that's a no, no, but back in the day we didn't know. <laughs> it's my excuse. Well, for those, just to put it in context, uh, this was the time of Betty for Dan, the feminine mystique, all of that's going on. Did you get any pushback because of that article? I didn't. And um, it's interesting because Iris and I, we really were feminists because we were the first people and we went to a meeting once and they were talking, I said, I've said this before, about burning their bras. And I said, I was the last person in school to get my bra. I'm not going to burn it, but I will help in other ways. I'll be really good at my job. <clears throat> and it was hard. It was hard as a woman back in the day. But because the Mary Tyler Moore people were so welcoming and wonderful and because of feminism, starting at the same time, the show and my life all came together right at the right time. It was perfect timing. Well, again, look at, you know, when I think of feminism, I think that, you know, anyone should be able to live their authentic truth, whatever that may be. And sometimes- it's Choice, choice is the word. People have to remember that, particularly nowadays. I never thought I'd live to see abortion reversed in my lifetime, but choice is the operative word there. Uh, can you repeat that word? <laughs> choice. Sure. Yes, because a, a lot of our choices are being taken away right now. Um, as you were forging out your career, do you feel that your career is a result of a lot of the choices that you made or the people that you met along the way and how that propelled you forward? I think it was a combination of the confidence my father gave me my father i say my father if i killed somebody my father would say they deserved it you know so i mean that's the kind of confidence i had from my father even though my mother tended to criticize me so i i knew i could do it i don't know how i knew but i did and i was so lucky to find gary and then i was beyond lucky that the mary tyler moore show came because it really even though gloria steinem had told jim brooks the producer that the show wasn't feminist enough because she called him mr grant oh there you go yes. and um no it was i was very lucky in timing and i was very lucky i had a supportive husband who was very happy with me having a career and us being equal which some girls weren't all my friends went to Wisconsin to get their MRS. Mm -hmm. And I went to Northwestern because I wanted a career. And my husband was very open to, I met my husband the day I was graduating college at UCLA. So he was very open to that. And then he became a writer um, under Gary and he had a very successful career. So I was both lucky and willing to take some chances at the right time being in the right place. Was there a particular moment in your career where you felt I've arrived, this is it? Or did you always feel that the brass ring was eluding you somehow? No, I was I was so incredibly lucky with Mary Tyler Moore and that article was unbelievable, whether I was on the cover or not. It was a, a major thing and I did, I, I got 13 assignments in my first half year, which was some kind of record and <clears throat> it all came from that. And I, I, I tell you the truth and I talk about resilience because it's so important. Had I struggled and had a tough time like most other people did, I don't think I would have made it because I wasn't very resilient. I thought, uh, I always say, you know, if I broke a nail, I'd cry. I mean, I was like the most sensitive, you know, scared little girl. But 
things were so good that I thought, oh, this is easy. This is working out fine. And I don't know what it would have happened to me had I not been that lucky. I've always said that I'm a product of 1960s and 70s television. And the 1970s, you know, with Maude and the Bob Newhart show and the Mary Tyler Moore show. But there was another aspect at those days that I miss. Uh, we have them somewhat on like the Hallmark Channel, but that was the made for TV movie. And then those started happening for you. I did two top 10. Well, there's a perfect example. I did two comedies, Movies of the Week. There you go, Bill Bixby. Um, the girl who came gift wrapped and, um, Mary, what was my other one? I can't remember the name of it. I don't know. Anyway. Um, and I did 15 altogether. Only two got made and I had the two top 10 comedies. Nobody else had them and I couldn't get the other 13 made. So that was what wore me down in the business. This called development hell. I made a wonderful career. I made a lot of money. I did a lot of work, but most of the stuff didn't get on. Mm -hmm. like pilots, movies of the week, movies. And I stopped doing episodes my second year because I was asked to do all these other things. So it, after 20 years, I said, that's it. <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore. Well, Judy Garland once said that the more well-known you are at what you do, the harder it gets because you have to sustain your place uh, in the business. You have to continue going on. Um, you talk about resilience. What did keep you going for the 20 years that you were there? Well, I, as I said, I was very lucky. I was cons I worked all the time. I didn't ever, I always had to turn down things. My agents were, you know, didn't have to make any calls. I got, a, a, because there were so few women and it was, Mary Tyler Moore show was the best show and starting there was, you know, a wonderful credit. Um, in 1989, we had a strike and I came to New York and I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. I couldn't stand this development hell of all these scripts being up on the shelf and never seeing the light of day. I took a year off and I networked. I met with 60 people and I decided I wanted to do a whole, as I said, reinvention. I went to work for Holocaust organizations because my father had always been very involved in Milwaukee. We had a Nazi Bund that was active during World War II and a lot of German people in Milwaukee, and that was kind of scary. And um, so it was something I always wanted to be involved with. So I went to work for the Anti-Defamation League. I ran their speakers bureau and I trained their speakers. And then I was the UN observer for the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And now I'm involved with the Friends of the Israel Defense Force. So that was my sort of reinvention. As I said, every 20 years, you have to find a new passion. And you've done it brilliantly. Well, thank you. I, I was fortunate to find, I, I'm looking for one now. I have to find a new passion to get me out of the house now. Well, I'm going to bring up a, a comment from Danielle. Um, Danielle is responsible for me reaching out to you. So uh, she says, speaking of that, were there any stories that you wanted to tell that the networks wouldn't let you or greatly censored at the time? Oh, gosh. Um, yes, I did a movie of the week that I really loved called What Are You Doing New Year's Eve? about women who were alone on New Year's Eve because they were dating married men, which was a naughty thing that I sort of did. And um, they thought it was great and then they wouldn't make it. Um, a lot of times we want, later I wanted to do shows about older women or women dealing with the problems of divorce or not having children or of real things in baby boomers' lives. And it's very, very hard still. Even with the success of Susan Harris and Golden Girls, they never wanted to do another show. I think um, Lily Tomlin now and, um, can't remember. And, and yeah, doing that. But uh, yeah, it's always been a business controlled by men. And now, sad to say, maybe women have a, a greater role, but ageism now has taken over. And it's, um, it's a very dangerous thing among the other isms. Well, do you feel that ageism was as prevalent then as it is now? Well, no. I mean, only later, um, after I retired, I, I there was a guy that I knew who was a very successful writer. He had created... ...talk and you go home and write. And the Writers Guild won an award from the Producers Guild for age discrimination. I got a nice check if we prove if we could prove that we were discriminated against. And it really, after 35, all of a sudden you were like, mm-mm, 50, uh-uh. And that's still a problem now. Are you 
in tune with what's going on in Hollywood today as far as films and television are concerned? I'm not, and I'm, I'm very supportive of the Guild, of course, I don't belong anymore, and I, I think the AI is a very scary thing. I think Fran Drescher is a terrific spokesperson. I thank you, absolutely. I think it's really, as always, the writers are the lowest on the totem pole. We've been out on strike for three, four months. The actors came in to help us. It's a very scary thing. And these enormously wealthy CEOs who couldn't care less about anybody but themselves, you know, don't want to be fair. And I mean, it's shocking that they've offered actors $187 for their image that they can use in perpetuity and they'll never get another dime. And, and I wrote back in the day when you only got 10 reruns. So we went on strike for that while I was a writer. Now they get reruns in perpetuity, but I only got 10. Every once in a while, I'll get a check for 89 cents. From a Dorothy, Dorothy Lyman on the show. And Dorothy, of course, was Naomi on Mama's Family. Joe Hamilton, who was the producer, came in and said, we have this opportunity to go into syndication, but in, for, in order for us to make this move, I may be paraphrasing a little bit, if everybody will sign off on this, everybody will get a large chunk of money now. And, and they did. And they did. And the show is on every single day on television. And she doesn't get a dime. No. It's it's frightening. And this whole AI thing of having robots right. And I mean, oh, please. It's just, you know, it's a very scary thing. I went to a conference in the Aspen Institute. I go every summer. I hadn't gone for a couple of years. But I went and they had a lot of panels on AI, artificial intelligence. I thought we had 10 years. They're saying we have five years now. Health-wise, it's going to help people tremendously to come up with medical solutions. But the rest of our lives and jobs are going to be gone, taken by robots. So, And trust me, we've seen it happen in other areas. Customer service doesn't exist anymore. Everything's automated. It's horrible. It's just a, a terrible way for our country and the world to go. Hell is taking over, right? Yes, absolutely. So I want to go back to 2017. That's when your book came out. Uh, what was your impetus for sitting down and telling your story at that time? <clears throat> That's such a good question. Um, I went to a party at Vanity Fair, the magazine, and I was sitting with Graydon Carter, who is the editor, and somebody else, a woman, and they asked me who I was, what I had done, everything. And she was in the music uh, end of things, and I told her, I have known some of the great music people in my life. I, I'm like Zelig. I've met so many people. It's like frightening in my life. Yes. And I had gone to college with Jim Morrison of The Doors, who was my friend. Of course, I was in the movies with Elvis. I met Tom Jones. You know, she said, oh, write an article about it. I said, OK, I will. So it's going to be called Name Dropping. Then Frank Langella wrote a book called Name Dropping. So I couldn't. Get, but once I looked at the article, I said to myself, hey, there's a book here. And I got an agent, we tried to sell it. And as I said, they wanted to me to name names and be a little more salacious than I was interested in. So I did it myself. And I counted, I think I have a hundred names in there, which is kind of frightening. I mean, I, I, I have met so many people, it's scary. It's really scary. Well, as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, it's not about you meeting them, it's them meeting you. <laughs> oh, okay, it's me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. It's me, me, me. No, it, it, because it, it, it's, first of all, you, you from, the, from the moment, your first chapter, if that doesn't get you, everyone, uh, nothing will. But when, I, I'm always curious, when you sat down to write your book, and yes, you had written this article, but are the first words that we read the first words that you wrote? No, I went chronologically. I started with my childhood and everything. And then um, when you when my agent tried to sell it and everything, I then put in, uh, I started with the chapter with Richard Nixon was a guest on Laughing. I had to make him say, you know, Sorry. Sorry. to me as a question, I couldn't get him to understand that, whatever. Anyway, I thought that would be a fun way to start. And then they wanted me to start with something else. And then I wanted to start with what I really started with was Vibrator Girl, which I want mention again. And, um, and then eventually I said, I got a really fabulous editor um, who was um, the editor of, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank now on this, on the wonderful writer. Oh my gosh, this is just terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Mitch Albom's editor. And, um, 
And she said, no, start with what you want to start with and name it what you want to name it. And I did. And I'm happy. But it was it went through many rewrites, about a year and a half of rewrites. And as you're writing the book, and and I love the way it's laid out, uh, do you, I mean, how did it shape you? I mean, I believe, and you're a writer, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, that when you begin to write the characters, and th there are a lot of characters in this book, they're real people, but it begins to take a life of its own. Uh, I mean, were you, I mean, were, were the thoughts just coming at you fast and furious as you were writing this book? Well, I was very fortunate in that I kept a diary for a certain point of time, so I had that to look at. And then I went through, for some of the people in the book, I went through um, uh, chronologically what movies they were in or what was going on to kind of remind myself. But it, um, a memoir is a very personal thing, you know. That's why when I did the audiobook, I did it myself. I can't imagine having an actor read your life. It would be so weird. But you kind of do it in the way that you want to tell your story. And as I said, sadly, but fortunately, my parents were no longer with me, so I could say things that I probably wouldn't say had they been alive in terms of my naughty days. And um, it just it just kind of flowed, but I did have two wonderful editors helping me, and that's always, you need another voice to tell you and help you with the cuts, usually. You know, sometimes one goes on too long. And um, yeah, it was it was a... It was hard. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Oh, wow. But I love doing it. What surprised you the most after you finished writing the book about what you had written? That I was much stronger than I thought and more resilient and that all those fears that I had, this fearful kid who wasn't allowed to cross the street, I walked alone in China. I mean, I was robbed in, I mean, in Brazil. I mean, I, how did I do that? I don't know. <laughs> And as you go back, how long after writing the book did you go in to do the audio book? Um, about six months, I think. And that was that was really fun, except when I got to the part about my parents passing, I cried. I had to take a break. That was hard um, because I'm on the radio now and I've done I used to do voiceovers and stuff like that. <clears throat> I wasn't afraid to do it. It was it was really fun. But when you got to the emotional parts, it was hard. Well, excluding writer. Uh, all of the hats that you've worn in your life and career, which hats fit the most comfortably and which you still have trouble putting on? Hmm, that's a good question. I've kind of only done stuff that I enjoyed. I had the luxury and the, um, the financial ability to, like even when I took the jobs at the Holocaust organizations, they didn't pay anything, but because I had done well in show business, I could afford to do it. I would love to have a talk show. That would be my favorite thing. <laughs> Hi, Richard. <laughs> yeah, ready. Uh, you can do it right here. The, you I know. know. You can, well, you know, and that brings me, you know, again, Danielle, she said you have to have her on the show. Thank you, Danielle. Now, um, what does Danielle do? Is she in biz? She's a psychic. Oh, my God. I'm so into that. I have to put you in touch because oh, she, she is it, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. I will hook you two up. I'm totally into that. And I have ESP, as I've written about in the book. And scary. And you, and you'll have to talk. For the guys that I've been involved with, once I'm involved with somebody, I know where they're going. I know where they are. I know what plane they're on. It's a little scary. I'm going to send your information with your permission to Danielle, and she'll get in touch with you. I thank her for she this. Get it. You are going to love her. She's been on this show a few times. And we just did a show last week about Saturn. Uh, uh, return. She is the best. I just oh, I'm thrilled. I'm excited. I love that. I do have ESP and I had it with my mother. My mother had it also with others and I have it with very close friends. I always know when they're going to call me or if I want to talk to them, I just think about them and they get the message. So, Well, there are certain things that I want to touch upon. First of all, you've done your radio program. You've written uh, for New York Social Diary. Uh, you uh, Are you still writing for New York Social Diary? I'm not. That was my dating column, The Search for Mr. Adequate, because there's no prince and there's no perfect. You find somebody who's more than adequate and you turn him into the one, and I'm still looking. So if anybody out there knows anybody tall, smart, fun, who's um, not a Trumper, if I may say, Yes. Uh, in my way. You may say that. You know, it's funny. There's a great line in a Mae West movie 
where her maid comes in and she says, I'm going to go out and get myself a husband. And Mae West says, leave the husbands alone and find yourself a single man. <laughs> yes, well, that, that, that's an issue. I would like him to be single. Yeah. Uh, speaking of brilliant writers, Mae West was a brilliant writer. And she was ahead of her time. As so well. ahead of her time. Who are the writers in this business that you really admire, uh, both male or female? Well, there was a there. As a matter of fact, there was a writer called Isabel Leonard who wrote, I think, Funny Girl. Yes. When I was in college, I entered a, a contest with the Writers Guild, and I was the only, I think, I was the youngest person, and she was one of the judges, and she's the first person who said to me, "You can do this." So of course, I worshipped her. I admired her. Uh, Treva Silverman, of course, had started ahead of me on Mary, and she did a, a great many of those. There were very few women writers. Uh, Joanna Lee, Lila Garrett were both friends of mine. I didn't have a lot of role models. Um, Norman Lear, I thought, was brilliant, of course. And Jim and Alan and the guys at Mary were so open and so warm and so helpful. And then when I became a story editor for a show called Square Pigs, I loved doing that because I was so nurtured as a writer. And a lot of people <clears throat> were not that way. When you came in, you pitched a story. We didn't have writer's rooms back in the day. You came in on your own, you pitched a story, then you went home and did an outline, then you went home and did the rewrites. But they didn't help you. They gave you like 20 minutes and then they expected you to read their minds. Whereas at Mary Tyler Moore, we were there all day and we knew exactly what they wanted. And we knew what each character would feel like, and, and they spent a lot of time with us, which is why I think that show is so wonderful and survived. Well, you know, I always look in this business, what I love about this business is the collaborative process. Uh, writing, as you mentioned earlier, it's a solitary profession for the most part, uh, but there's a lot of collaboration that goes into that in terms of what shapes your career and how you shape the business that you're in. How do you feel that some of the choices that you made uh, shaped the early part of uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show. I think you left just before Betty White came onto the show. Yeah, I left in the second year. <clears throat> I went to New Heart and then I went to my own pilots. Um, as I said, I only did stories of my own life. And so if I didn't have an idea, I would like be at the phone book. Oh my God, A, airplanes, you know, B, ball. I don't. So I came in because I was a woman living a feminist life, married and working. I would come in with stories from my own life. So I did, um, the first time Mary had sex, mm -hmm. an article that said she's not sexed enough or something. I did the, my first show was something any woman could pitch. Every woman knows you have to stand up for a wedding with someone you don't like and wear a hideous gown. And that was my first story. And they thought it was so fabulous. Any woman could have come in and told that story, but men don't know from that. Um, I did a story about dating a professor because I had. Um, another thing, women's point of view, women need their friends. I have my best friends. I couldn't live without my friends. But sometimes you want your own place and you don't want your friend in your nest. So when there was a job that came available at the station that Rhoda would be good for, Mary's first instinct was to take it off the board. And Lou Grant said, oh, my God, you're rotten like the rest of us. But of course, she wasn't. So she put it back on. And of course, Valerie said, I wouldn't want that awful job. I got a better job. You know? <clears throat> but, you know, guys play sports. It's a different thing the way they team. Women, we can be with our best friends, but still want our own little space. Speaking of best friends. How did your friends respond to your book when it came out? Oh, that's so interesting. They were very supportive. Um, and my ex-husband was really lovely. And his new wife wrote a great review, which was like the most lovely thing. She said she feels like she knows me and, and heard the book with having lunch with me or something, which was I've never met her. Um, everybody was very lovely and very supportive. And... Um, yeah. <laughs> and words, I don't know. <laughs> and why New York? I mean, after being so much a part of, you're a Midwestern girl, a woman, uh, and then you uh, were out in Hollywood, and then you made the shift to New York. What was it eventually that brought you here? Yeah, LA is all about the business. It's the only thing that exists there. Like I said, you know, if you, if you had a guy coming to fix your shower, he'd say, I was at Dolly Parton's house yesterday, you know, but can you fix the shower? It doesn't matter. He was at Dolly Parton. And I got sick of it when I got divorced and I didn't want to be in the business anymore. 
There's no reason to be in LA except for the sun. So I came to New York and New York is, you can walk out on the street and have a social life, mm-hmm. you know, which during the pandemic I found out I didn't do, but most of the time you can. There's always something going on here. There are all kinds of different businesses, all kinds of different worlds to be in. And it's just, a, I love it here. Was it an easy acclimation or transition for you? It was because I was successful. I was always afraid before. I never could have gone before. I would have been overwhelmed. But I came in, the TV guys here were so nice to me because I had worked out in LA, CBS. I was very close with them and it was very easy. And then when I when I, I came twice, I came once when I got divorced in, in the 70s and then I went back there for my career and then I came back here in, in 89 and I sold my house and my car in three weeks and I, been here ever since. I know that you've been away from that world for quite some time now, but as you look at the business itself and, you know, when, of course, as we mentioned, the writers and, uh, you know, the actors are now on strike, uh, excluding that aspect that we already are aware of, um, what do you think are the biggest changes that you've seen in the business for the better and things that are no longer in place that you miss that were in place when you first got into the business? I don't think there's anything better. I think it's all worse. I mean, the streaming has taken away, I mean, on one hand, it's given people opportunities, but we used to have a certain quality at the networks. And like I said, we didn't have writer's rooms. We wrote it our own. Now they're all in a room yelling at each other. I, I, I don't get that. And I don't watch comedies now. I, the weirdest thing, and I read an article about it, during the pandemic, I started watching real life murder mysteries like stalkers and serial killers and i i don't know why and on the discovery channel and i read an article that said because life is so uncertain and so terrible now we need to know that they're caught in the end and that justice is done and that's what i watch well have you seen the last call killer on hbo no well it's it's currently running it's based on an incredible book uh by elon green uh the next chapter which is this sunday night sad but true story um is about one of my dear friends that was the victim of his you know this was many many years ago uh it's a great book but it's it's, a serial killer it's about a serial killer he was called the last call killer where was it richard uh, in new york city uh during the 80s yes yes and uh so uh american horror story their last series was based on this killer. Okay, that uh, I don't like. I can't stand America. I can't. That I didn't like. I, it's horrific. It is so horrific. Uh, I mean, in the remaining moments that I have here, uh, again, Daniel brought you to my attention uh, through, uh, you know, familiar with your work, but you have really embraced social media, and social media has embraced you. The funny thing is I hadn't gone out of the house for two years, but 20 times I had gone to the dentist and the bank and I was, I was really quite nuts. And I just let my hair go and that's all. And I didn't go to the gym and whatever. And I walked out about six months ago and I'm walking down the street in my mother's coat. And there's a guy named Joshua Kame and he has a show called, um, ladies of Madison Avenue. And he stopped me and watched me. And he asked about my coat and my hair and everything. And that got me so much stuff. And I said to myself, boy, you got to leave the house. Good things happen. And I did a couple other things after that. And now I'm trying to get out a little more. And um, when I did my book tour, they had me go on Instagram. I still don't do it a lot, but um, I do a little. But I love Twitter. I'm a resistor um, against you know which former jerk. Mm-hmm. And um, I, that I'm very intent on, and I do that constantly. And I do love Facebook. And during award shows and things like that, and being alone, I love to watch them on Facebook with people because it's like sharing it with other people. And I, I do think, though, there are a lot of dangers now with with the internet. There are a lot of good things too. And um, yeah, I I um, I didn't join the new thing. Threads. Yeah, no, I, it's all too much for me. And I am like. When, when they see me coming at the Apple store, they run. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. I, I actually signed up for threads, but I haven't used it. 
I don't. I don't. I can barely do anything. I mean, and 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 like even for this, I was so afraid I wouldn't know where the link was, and I don't know. I mean, just terrible at it. And 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 my um, my password at Apple is something naughty, and they say, "Oh, here comes the you know what lady." Because <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what it is. I think you may want to change your password. <laughs> Um, I actually left Twitter for a while, and then I saw Elon Musk uh, on uh, the Bill Maher show. I love Bill Maher. Mm -hmm. um, but after he, his appearance on the Bill Maher show, I came back to Twitter because of what he said and how it's important that all of us, everyone watching, we have a voice, especially nowadays. You mentioned earlier choice. Our choices are being taken away from us. And if you think that's someone else's issue, that's someone else's problem, no, it affects every one As of us. As they said during the Holocaust, the famous saying, first they came for the labor union and <laughs> then they came for, and then they came from me and there was no one left. So please speak up and be, yeah, I'm very worried about the election. I'm very worried about the court. None of our institutions have held, and it's a very scary time. I feel for these babies that we love so much and what their lives are going to be. Could you imagine yourself, with everything that you know now, uh, working in today's Hollywood? Um, probably not, because when Me Too came, I asked my friends later, I said, that never happened to me. I mean, maybe I'm not gropeable or something. I don't know. I mean, I had one or two things. I did have the Bill Cosby thing, which you'll read about, blah, blah, blah. But I never was punished because I said no, because maybe I was married or I had a big mouth and they were, I don't know, Harvey Weinstein didn't like me. So, you know, I didn't like my type. But um, do you think, I, it was, I mean, I, I mean, you come across to me as a very strong, confident woman. Uh, do you think that that had something to do with it? I don't know. Um, I cried at the drop of a hat. So I was always crying. So I don't know. Um, I, I honestly think I was very lucky to come at the time I did and to have the people around me, like my ex, like Gary Marshall, like the MTM guys. Um, now, I don't know. I really don't. Um, I think everything is tougher now in the world. We're going through a tough time. When you were working in Hollywood, and then again with your book, um, as I mentioned earlier, that yeah, it's a solitary profession for the most part, um, what was your process like, and what is a typical day like, if, if there's such a thing, in your life? I'm so embarrassed to say now, but back in the day, I wrote at night, which is probably why I'm divorced. I wrote from 7 to 11 at night, because I can't think in the morning. I sleep late, and I, I'm very much better in the evening. And so I, I always wrote at night. Um, because I was an only child and a writer and... I played with my dolls, whatever. I, I, I live very actively in my head. I don't need a lot of mm -hmm. company. And when I go out to my Renaissance weekends or Aspen Institute or something, I'm very bombarded with a lot of stimuli. I have to, I'm very good and then I have to come home and be alone for 10 days because I can't take all the energy. Now, I'm very lazy. I have, I, I, I've been getting up at six in the morning. I don't know why. I go to bed earlier. I try to go to sleep for an hour and I watch too much news. My shrink said, don't watch the news and get out of the house. I said, okay, those are two good things. <laughs> well, I, I have to do more of those things. Not only is your book incredible, your website is fun. I love your website. I love that it's constantly evolving and everything. Uh, Susan, I'm in love with you. I have to tell oh. you, full disclosure, I have had a blast today. I hope you've had as much fun as I've had. I have, and it's gone by so fast, and you've been extremely kind and very lovely, and you're my new best friend. Well, thank you. Along with Harvey Brownstone, who we both love. So Harvey, and if you're Danielle, watching, Danielle, I can't wait. Danielle, I can't wait to introduce the two of you. And thank you, Danielle, for this suggestion. It comes with, in this business, it all boils down to yes or no. And thank you uh, for, and, and thank you for saying yes. I'm going to give you the final word in just a moment. It could be about anything that we spoke about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with. It can be anything. And I do mean anything. Uh, so, but before I get there, I'm going to give my final word. I'll turn it over to you. Don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. Uh, 
I want to share with everyone that I, you know, those of you who watch my show, I know I can speak for Susan when I say this. We don't take it lightly when you show up. So thank you all for being here. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave a comment on YouTube and share this with your friends. And then I want you to do me a favor. I want you to call your favorite bookseller and I want you to ask if they have this book on the shelf. And then if they don't, insist that they do get it on the shelf okay. and order two copies, Keep one for yourself. And then I want you to reach out to the sixth name on your Facebook friends list and I want you to send a copy to them and let them know, write a little inscription inside, why they matter in your life. It's important that we tell people this now before it's too late. I also end every show, and Susan, I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing. Pick up the phone and call someone today that you haven't spoken to in a long time. Uh, not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call and let that person know that they've made a difference in your life. And by doing so, you're going to make a difference in their lives. It's important that we do this because believe it or not, even with as divided as this country is right now, we are all connected. Everything that happens in the next state, in the next county, in the next city affects each and every one of us, whether you think it does or not. I have a dear friend, he says, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. And with that, I'm going to leave the screen. And Susan, it's all yours. I don't think I can top that. And you brought me to tears. Um, everybody do reach out to people. When I lost three people last month, that's what I did. It's so important. Life goes by like that. We're living in very tough times. Please, please, please vote for somebody who cares about something other than themselves. You know what I mean. It's really important. I wrote an article about fascism because certain people are using Goebbels techniques. It's very important, people. Do the right thing. And thank you, Richard, for a wonderful, bringing me to tears, but wonderful time. Bye.